I want to begin by reading Romans chapter 10, the first 17 verses. And, and, I, and I'm really, I'm, I'm wanting to just think through together uh, the idea of appealing uh, to sinners. And um, whether it's biblical, whether we should be doing that or not. Uh, and just and so we want to think through some of that together tonight from a number of scriptures. We'll begin reading with this passage, but I'll be, you can kind of keep your fingers loose. We'll be turning to a number of scriptures tonight uh, because I, I want us to get the, I want us to come away with a sense of, of the spirit of, well, God's heart revealed in the scriptures as he manifests to us through his servants, how they went about, including Jesus himself, um, appealing to sinners. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. He's talking about his kindred according to the flesh. Here. He's talking about that nation, that people. Okay, He's not talking about spiritual Israel in this Verse, there's some who may disagree with that. I don't see how it could be that because he, in the very next verse, he says, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. He's not talking about born again ones here. He's talking about those he has a burden to see saved, which is interesting. He says, he says he's praying for this. Is he praying in the will of God? That's one of those... We could go off into a whole discussion about that, couldn't we? He, he knew that all Israel, uh, all Israel in the sense of all physical Israel, would not be saved. And yet he's praying his heart's desire, his burden is that. I think that's instructive to us. I think that's helpful for us. If anyone believed in the absolute sovereignty of God and divine election, it was the Apostle Paul. And yet that did not keep him from being burdened and from praying for the salvation of a whole group of people. Not just one person, a whole group of people. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted them submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. We heard about these things this morning. In the first hour, the, the, the man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, and here it is, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So you can see the sequence of events here. Preaching, they work your way backwards. Preaching, hearing, believing, calling. The calling is a result of believing, hearing, preaching. So, you know, there's, a, there's an order there. How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Who are they? Well, I mean, those who have heard. I mean, the, 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 the message was sent forth. It was preached. It is preached. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? 
but just keep this in mind. We'll be, I'll be emphasizing this distinct, distinction in a moment. The gospel was still preached. Just because they didn't respond doesn't mean the gospel wasn't preached. The gospel was preached. So I'm going to say this again, but there's a difference between the gospel and the response to the gospel. It's not one and the same thing. Okay. The, the, I'm, I'm tempted to get ahead of myself here. Let me, let me just finish reading verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, so as a preacher, and I'm thinking of myself in the context of maybe in the church or maybe in the prison or out on the street or, or, or you in a similar situation or maybe a one-on-one -on -one situation where you are, you are preaching in a sense, you're telling, you're foretelling the gospel, you're, you're delivering the gospel. There are times when we deliver a message that includes a strong appeal to respond to that message, to that gospel that's being preached, including a warning of judgment to those who continue in unbelief. Now, is that right? There are those who contend that we are misguided to preach or evangelize with the expectation of response. The reasoning goes something like this. Our responsibility is to deliver the message. Deliver the message and shut up. Putting it crudely. Now just deliver the message. Don't be concerned about the response. Don't speak as if you are concerned about a response. That's God's business. In fact, if you're going to do anything, maybe what you ought to leave them with is you're damned and walk away. And I've been around preachers like that. Where that's, you get the sense that they don't even want anybody to respond. Should we preach the gospel with expectation of response? Or should we simply proclaim it with no desire, no hope, no expectation of any true conversions? It just simply shouldn't be on our radar screen. We should preach with indifference. Disconnected. Is that, is that the way we should evangelize? But we know it's true that some plant and some water, right? And we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For the sake of time, I won't go there. Familiar passage, but you can read it, verses 5 through 8. Paul is making the argument there. They were lifting up men, and he's saying, listen, hang on. Some plant, some water. It's God that gives the increase. So no, no one needs to be boasting about anything. It's God that gives the increase. So, so we know God gives the increase. But does this mean that we should have... No expectation of increase or of fruit from our labors. Are we wrong to approach preaching and evangelism with, with, with expectation? Of, are we wrong to approach it with expectation of fruit? Or conversely, are we wrong not to expect? I mean, think of it both ways. Well, it's certainly no secret that Paul was burdened for the salvation of souls, right? We saw that in Romans 10.1. You can see it again in places like 1 Corinthians 9. I'm not going to turn to all of these scriptures, but in 1 Corinthians 9, where he actually talks about, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty strong language. I'm free, he says in verse 19. Though, though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all. Why, Paul? Why have you done this? That I might win the more. And, he, and in verse 23, after working through several thoughts related to that and what he has done, he says, Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. And then he concludes chapter 10 with a similar thought. He says that whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And that includes the desire to see people saved. 
He says in verse 33, Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. He chided the Jews because they were persecuting him and others so that the Gentiles would not be saved. Remember that? So we know that's the burden of the Apostle Paul. Well, let me ask this question. Is the gospel good news for everyone? For everyone? I don't know that I've actually thought of that question until a month or so ago. I heard somebody actually ask that. Is the gospel good news for ever? After all, we know all are not going to be saved. So is it good news for everyone? Well, we can conclude this. The gospel is good news. It is good news for sinners. It's the message of what God has done to reconcile sinners to himself, right? That's the message Paul preached everywhere he went. He labored to, pre he labored to preach it where it had never been preached. He, he, that, was, that was his burden, the gospel. And, and what is that? We, we, one of the hymns we sang said, Pre, uh, uh, preach it clear and plain. Is that what is that in the chorus? Clear and plain. Do, do you think sometimes we complicate it? And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and listen, I am not saying that there are not depths to the gospel that none of us have yet plummeted to. I mean, have, 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 have delved into. There, the gospel is deep and wide. And that's why we're continually growing in our understanding and appreciation of it. But the gospel, in a sense, is, is simple. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you. Do you remember when Paul went to the Galatian, or he wrote to the Galatians? He says, he spoke of Christ being crucified among you. Was, cru was Christ crucified among the Galatians? He was crucified in, outside of Jerusalem, was he? How was he crucified among the Galatians? Through the preaching. The gospel. I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. So you have the gospel and you have the reception of the gospel. They're not the same thing, okay? But the gospel is good news for sinners. That's the point we're making here. And in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Here's, here's the message. Here's what was preached, what was delivered. That Christ died for our sins. The substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. The death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the message of the gospel that Paul said he preached in 2 Corinthians 5. And verses 18 and 19, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is the gospel that he preached. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, here it is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And we might... What was imputed to Christ? Verse 21, For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That, that's the gospel. So the, so the gospel is good news, it is the only good news for sinners, actually. There is no other good news for sinners than the gospel. The gospel is effectual, though, unto salvation only to those who believe. Romans 1.16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God 
unto salvation. And oftentimes there's a period placed there by folks, but that's not, there's no period there. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. That used to bother me. I used to think, well, if the gospel is the power of God and salvation for everyone, why isn't everybody saved? Because it's not the power of God and the salvation for everyone. It's for those who believe, you see. Both Jew and Greek, the whole world, those who believe. And so the gospel is separate from the response, but it demands a response. The gospel is not the same as the response to it, but it demands a response wherever it is preached. And so we go back to Romans 10 and verses 9 through 13. And, and this is the response. In fact, you hear the gospel in this, but Paul is emphasizing a response to this. When he says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart the gospel, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be, you will be saved. And that, that he raised him from the dead is just, that's like, you know, there's big words they use to talk about how one thing represents a whole. And that's what's going on here. The resurrection of Christ assumes the death of Christ, Right? For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we can conclude this from Scripture, that the gospel should be declared to all, not just to those we think will respond, but to all, where do we get that? Where do we get that? That's a simple one. The, the commission, right? I mean, Mark 16, 15, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Um, Luke 24, 46 and 47, these things must be preached in all nations that Christ, and he gives the gospel. It was necessary that Christ die and that he rise again. And these things are to be preached unto all nations, repentance and remission of sins. Acts 1 and verse 8. The, after that, the, when the power... But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the uttermost parts of the earth, the end of the earth. And so we, we, we don't have to guess at whether the gospel should be preached to all. That's as clear as can be from Scripture. But the gospel is a savor of life unto life only to those who believe. To those who do not believe, it is, as Paul calls it, a savor of death unto death. And this is sobering, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and this is one of the reasons why we can say that we're always victorious when we preach the gospel, always, always. Regardless of the response, there always will be a response, by the way. There always will be some response. But regardless of whether there's a response or what the response is, we are victorious. Paul says, in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. That's a, that's a much clearer expression than what I know many of you are reading the King James, and it's not quite as clear what's being said there. But that's, it's the diffusion of this fragrance of His knowledge in every place. That's the glory of, of Christ being proclaimed. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. Do you see that? To God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, 
We are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? When you think about that, the weightiness of that. For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, that is of sincerity and as of as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. But you see, you see the point I'm making here is that the gospel is the gospel, regardless of the response. The gospel is still the, the gospel doesn't change. And you see, the conclusion that I come to here at this point in the discussion tonight is we should preach the gospel to please God first. Always. I don't always think that way. That's going to affect what, affect what you say to people. You're going to stay true to the gospel. If you, if you really are thinking it's to God that I must. For I am an, This is an a, a, aroma. The fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. An aroma. He's pleased. And so with confidence we can preach, knowing that he will call sinners by that gospel while others will reject it to their condemnation. And that's one of the weighty things about preaching the gospel. We know that the results, humanly speaking, are going to be mixed. But always we're triumphant because God is pleased. God is satisfied. And that needs to bring a, a, an encouragement to us, a, a comfort to us. Okay, so is the gospel good news for everyone? Well, it is good news. It's good news for sinners. But that good news doesn't end up being good news for those who do not believe. It ends up being news of condemnation. Another question. Then we're kind of building here. Should we challenge sinners indiscriminately? To respond to the message. So we have the message, the gospel message. Some people say that you haven't preached the gospel until you have challenged. I disagree with that. The gospel is not the same thing as a challenge. The gospel is not the same thing as an appeal. Okay, the gospel, and then there's the appeal to receive it, to believe it, to repent. Some say that it's wrong to appeal based upon that. Theological thought that God will save whom and when he pleases, which we would agree with. But that doesn't lead us, doesn't lead me to say that we should not appeal. Because we have too many scriptures to lead us otherwise. Don't we? Too many biblical expressions, too many examples. One from the Old Testament, Isaiah 55. Brother Dell, you were mentioning this the other day. Uh, ho, ho, everyone who thirsts. I don't have anything else to say to you. No, come. Come to the waters. And you have no money, come. Buy wine and milk without money, without price. Skip down to verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Why are you telling folks to do that? Don't you know God will get that done without you saying that? Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon and we don't have to we don't have to couch such biblical expressions in all, in all kinds of theological explanations. Well, I just want you to know that you really can't come. You really don't have the ability to come. I know I'm telling you to do that, but you really can't do Why? Why? Why would I say that? Just speak God's word. Appeal. Jesus appealed, didn't he? We saw that this morning in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. It's probably one of the clearest ones which says that Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God 
and saying. So he was delivering the message. The message was the message of the kingdom of God, which I would suggest is synonymous with the gospel. Different emphasis and aspects of it, but the gospel. And saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, the gospel is, Jesus has come. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's an appeal. He appealed to the rich man, didn't he? In Mark 10. And verse 21 Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And he didn't just stop with the things he had said. He, he presses him, one thing you lack. Doesn't that sound like an appeal? Reasoning, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, 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 take up the cross and follow me. That's an appeal. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Repent, or you shall likewise perish. Chapter John 12, verse 36, and other places in John 12. And in John 7, you can see it again. Jesus cried out, Drink, if you're thirsty, come drink with me. I'm the light, come to me. Peter appealed. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, it's interesting. He gets to a point in his message. He's delivering the message. He's preaching the message. He's preaching the gospel. And he's interrupted. And the question is, what shall we do? And Peter doesn't stop there and say, I have no idea. Oh, I'm, I'm just the ambassador. I just... I just deliver the message. No, Peter said to him, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of this Jesus Christ I've been declaring to you. For the remission of sins or expressing that your sins are remitted really is the idea of the language here. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 3 and verse 19, Peter preaching again. He says, repent therefore and be converted. That's an appeal. Paul appealed on Mars Hill in Acts 17 and verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. He's speaking on God's behalf. God commands you. To repent, we can do the same thing. You remember when he was standing before Agrippa in Acts 26? And Agrippa was affected in Acts 26 and verse 27. He says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. A lot of preachers in some of the circles that I have been in would never have said what Paul said. But what did Paul say? I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am except for these chains. Does that sound like a, an appeal to you? Spurgeon commenting on Mark 1 and verse 15 that we already read where Jesus he said, repent and believe the gospel. He says, it's clear from this passage that our Lord exhorted men to repent and to believe the gospel. There are some who profess to be his followers who will not suffer us to do this. We may teach men, warn them, they say, but we must not exhort them to repent and believe. Well, 
Spurgeon says, As the contention of these people is not in accordance with the Scriptures, we are content to follow the Scriptures and to do as Jesus did. So we shall say to sinners, Repent ye and believe the gospel. I like that. So should we challenge sinners indiscriminately to respond? And I answer yes. If we're preaching the gospel, yes. Well, then this question. How aggressive should we be in challenging sinners indiscriminately to respond? How aggressive should we be? And this is not a simple one to answer because every situation is different, isn't it? But we can say this, never ever, whether it's on a, in a one-to-one -one situation or in a group situation or in an open-air situ situation, never ever should there be manipulation and never should we be overbearing in our appeal. I mean, I, some of you may have grown up into this, you know, we're, I mean, it was, we, you know, you sing just as I am until somebody came forward, you know. I mean, the preacher, especially, especially if he was an evangelist, he was not going to stop until he had some success which was somebody coming forward in the meeting. And even though we recoil at that as well, we should. I believe maybe we are a little bit too timid in our appeals to sinners to whom we preach the gospel. When you read a passage like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 20, remember Paul has said, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, that we're ambassadors. We've been given a message. It's, it, the message has been given. It's been entrusted to us. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. That's a strong word that's used there. In the New King James, it's translated pleading. And I think that's a good way to express it. God is exhorting. God is pleading. It seems almost uncomfortable to us, doesn't it? Something in our, with, our, some of, with our theological system of thinking. Paul wasn't uncomfortable with this. He says, we implore, King James is pray. We, we pray you, we implore you on Christ's behalf or in Christ's stead. I prefer that actually. I mean, as if, Christ were standing here just recently when I was preaching in St. Louis. I, at one point in the message, I, I had this overwhelming sense to make this appeal based upon this passage. And I actually did come away from around from the pulpit and, and, and appealed to those to whom I was preaching. Be reconciled to God. The gospel message has just been delivered. The gospel of reconciliation. And so there is an appeal. It is right. We are absolutely right to appeal with sinners to be reconciled to God. We are right to warn sinners of the wrath to come. Like Noah. Noah. Peter talks about him. He was a preacher of righteousness. And in fact, in 1 Peter chapter 3, the Scriptures, that's one of those difficult passages there. In 1 Peter 3, in verse 19. I mean, in verse 18 is the Gospel. And in fact, when Brother Sebastian was here recently and said, you know, if you had a single verse... 
that would encapsulate the gospel the clearest which verse would it be or something like that do you remember that question in his message and I was thinking he was going to go to John 3.16 or something, which would have been a good one. He went to um, 2 Corinthians 5.21. 1 Peter 3.18 is where my mind was going. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. There's the gospel in one verse right there. But notice verse 19, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. The spirits who are now in prison, he preached. When did he preach? He preached through Noah. I believe that's the point here. Noah was the preacher of righteousness. And Noah was preaching this gospel to those in his day. These spirits who were now in prison, Christ preached through Noah to them. And what was his message? He was warning who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. Boy, does that make you uncomfortable that God actually waited? In the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water and but there was a message going forth, and I have a hunch that there was an appeal being made. There's at least a warning. I mean, the, the whole building of the ark was a warning, wasn't it? And then you have that passage in Ezekiel 33. And I'm not going to delve into this. I don't want to make more of it than we should. Maybe more of it is made by some folks than it should be, but there's at least a, a principle here that affects us here on this point. How aggressive should we be in challenging sinners? So you, son of man, verse 7, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked, so you can't save the wicked, but you can warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. You're free from the blood. Paul said, I'm free from the blood of all men. That's a New Testament expression that's similar to that. Because he was faithful to preach the gospel and to warn and to appeal. But it can be discouraging, can't it? And I'm sure that that's one of the reasons why there are those groups who find other ways. And even going back to Charles Swinney, I mean, he had to find a better way. People weren't responding quickly enough or in mass enough. And so we've got to make this, we've got to find a way to be able to, um, to make this sort of a, you know, a one, two, three step sort of thing where you do these things and we can just stamp you as saved, you know. But I would say to you, and maybe more to me, but because I get discouraged when I preach a message and, and I preach with a burdened heart and I appeal. And there have been times in the lifetime of my ministry where I have sometimes even sat across the table from someone and I felt absolutely for sure that God was dealing with that person. But it wasn't, there was no response. And I've had that happen in preaching where surely there's going to be someone who's going to confess Christ today. It seems so real that the message was going forth with such power. And it can get discouraging. But in the face of discouragement, we need to be encouraged to remain faithful, not to change the message or to manipulate the message or to try to find some way in which we can move people, motivate people. We need to be faithful to our God-given evangelistic ministry, which is first, 
What's the first thing we need to do in our evangelistic ministry? Who do we need to please first? God. Make sure the aroma is sweet. Make sure the gospel is going forth in truth, right? An appeal based upon that message and then leave it with God. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. We don't faint. We, and and I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful for these kinds of verses because I'm, I know I'm one who can, can lose heart. It becomes difficult. And sometimes even these questions like, what's the use? What's the point? It doesn't seem like anybody ever, I mean, if you only want to hear, people aren't responding. Do you all know what I mean? And, then, and it, can, it can be discouraging. Paul says, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And so, let me just close with a couple of thoughts here. When communicating the gospel, it is proper to remind, and I think this is part of the appeal, but it's proper to remind the sinner of the damning nature of unbelief. Would you all agree with that? It's proper to remind the sinner of the damning nature of unbelief. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting this from John 3, verse 18. He who believes in Him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. And I believe we can even go over to 1 John chapter 5 and what is it, verse 10 or 11, 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there. And we can say to people, listen, if you do not believe the record that I'm delivering you that God has given, if you do not believe the record that God has given of His Son, you are making God a liar. That's what John says in John 5. And so we can appeal to people with these biblical truths. And we can appeal to them, telling them, listen, the gospel that you have just heard is the power of God only to those who believe. I sat with about a dozen men this last Friday because they were doing construction in the room. It was a mess. And I went in and just had to adapt to the situation. So I said, come on, guys, let's just gather around. Let's talk. And so I was able to go through the gospel with them. I mean, clearly go through. I just asked them, do y'all have a testimony? You're in here. This is, this is faith-based dorm. Do you have a testimony? And like one of them threw his hand up, you know. And what is a testimony? Well, it's your life experience. Well, yeah, but I'm talking about a testimony of, of salvation. And they didn't really know what I was talking about. And so I was able to go through the scriptures and I was able to show to them, listen, I said, listen, there's two things going on here. There's the gospel, and I'm going to tell you what it is. And then there's the response to the gospel. And then I read 1 Corinthians 15. And I read to them, listen, do you see that? The gospel which I preached to you, which also you received. So Paul preached it, but they received it. There's, there's the testimony. If you have a testimony, you haven't just heard the gospel. You can't. It's not just that you can regurgitate the facts about the gospel. You have received the gospel. You have believed. And I was able to press that upon them. And then to go to Romans chapter 10. And to work our way through those thoughts and say, listen, those who believe, you know what they're going to do? What are those who believe going to do? They're going to call. I mean, that's a desperation here. They're going to call, call on the Lord that they believe is the only one who can save them. He's the only one. Well, if you believe the gospel, you, that's what you believe, right? There's no other Savior of sinners. And so you call upon Him whom you believe. 
Those who have understanding of the gospel will not remain indifferent to the word of faith that has come to them. The word of faith that they are hearing. And what is that word of faith that they're hearing? It's not do better. It's not get your act together. It's not improve your life. It's not... It's, it's no works of the law, any law. The law of love, law of Moses, law of anything. That is not the way to be delivered from your sins. No. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So this man quoted that verse to me and he said, so if I've, if I've done those things, then I'm saved. And this is what I said to him. I said, you're thinking, you're thinking too much about what you have done. You need to think about the one that you are confessing. The one that you are believing. That's the point. Because I'm going to guarantee you right now, your confessing and believing is going to wax and wane. As I told those men, what's going to happen when you're like Peter and you get and you freeze in a moment of challenge and you don't confess Christ? Does that mean that you're not saved? Jesus says, if you don't confess me before men, I'll not confess you before my Father in heaven. So it does mean something, not confessing him. But what if that how does that mean that you're not saved? No. Because your salvation is in the one you have confessed, not in your confession. Your salvation is the one in whom you're believing, not your believing, you say. It's the one upon whom you are calling, not the calling. It's the gospel. But if you believe, you will call. You see, you will respond. And you will know that you are one that he has called. You're one of his sheep. Because my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. And I give to them eternal life. So our appeal to those to whom we preach the gospel is, I think, if I could summarize it, it would be this. If you're talking to somebody, because you ever feel awkward when you're giving the gospel to somebody and you get to the end and it's like, what do I do now? <laughs> right? I mean, you know, you could say, well, I'll just walk away and leave it with God, which there may be some situations where that is the right answer, okay? But I would suggest this. Just say to the person, if you believe what you are hearing, call upon the Lord who alone is able to save you. And I would just suggest this, saying, do you mind if I pray for you? And just close the time in prayer and leave it with God, right? Leave it with God. And the fact of the matter is, if they have heard and believed, they will call, right? That's evangelism. I think that's biblical evangelism. So... I hope that's helpful to work through some of these thoughts. Any questions, comments?